Good morning, chemistry students. Today we're going to talk about heating curves and what kind of information we can get from looking at one of these types of graphs. Now if you look at this heating curve, you'll notice that it kind of has this stair step structure to it, and there's letters labeled for each of the key parts. Now, the way in which we interpret this is based on the same axes every time. So we can talk about those first and then focus on the actual stair step structure. Now you'll notice that the y-axis is degrees Celsius. So this is a way of measuring the temperature of our substance. So we're measuring it in degrees Celsius. The x-axis you'll often see is one of two ways. It'll either be heat absorbed, kilojoules in this case, or it's time with the assumption that you're heating the substance up at a fixed rate over time. So what we want to then do is look at the amount of energy that the substance absorbs over time and compare that with the actual temperature of the substance. So this heating curve is specific for water. Different substances will follow very similar patterns, but their values might be slightly different based on the actual properties of that substance. Now the first part of the graph starts off, and it's the letter A is this first sloped line. This represents the solid state of matter. So this would be ice in the case of water. Ice can get below zero degrees Celsius, and our graph goes down to a possible negative 50, and this shows us the possible temperature range that ice can be at. We've talked about changing temperatures and being able to calculate how much energy something either absorbs or releases, the Q value, based on the, the amount that you have, the mass, and how much your delta T is, how much temperature you're actually changing. The new part for us is going to be these plateaus. So this plateau, labeled as B, is the phase change in between a solid and then the next sloped line, which is labeled as part C, this is a liquid. So this would be our liquid water. So the plateau labeled B, this is the phase change. And at this point in time, we would have both a liquid and a solid presence. This is the process of a cube of ice actually melting. If you held an ice cube in your hand, it would melt over time. It doesn't happen instantaneously. In a solid, we have our water molecules stacked up in a solid in a fixed formation. Gonna, there's an organized pattern there. Whereas a liquid, if I have a beaker, the water molecules are going to be more random, and they're moving around. They're flowing past each other. I could swirl my beaker and get those water molecules to move around inside. Now to go from a solid to a liquid requires energy. Now the, you'll notice that the temperature doesn't change at these plateaus. This plateau, this first one, letter B here, represents the temperature at which this phase change occurs, which is zero degrees Celsius. This we either call the melting point or the freezing point, depending on which direction we're looking at these graphs in. Going from a solid to liquid obviously would be the melting point. Going from a liquid back to a solid would be the freezing point. So that plateau occurs at zero degrees Celsius. Now the length of this plateau is dependent on the intermolecular forces within the molecules themselves, or between the molecules themselves, I should say. So if I have ice, my solid structure, if I draw it a little bit more spread out here, there's an attraction between these particles. If I draw multiple water molecules here, these water molecules are attracted together. It requires energy to break these intermolecular forces. So the temperature isn't being used, or I'm sorry, the energy isn't being used to raise the temperature of the substance. The heat that's being added is used to break the intermolecular forces, the IMFs, I'll shorten it. So that's why we have a plateau. The temperature of the substance does not change. So if you have ice floating in water, it will always be at zero degrees Celsius. That energy is being used to either create or break those IMFs. After liquid, we get to the next phase change. This is letter D up at the top here. This is the transition between a liquid and then a gas, which is letter E up in the top right corner here. The transition between a liquid and a gas, this could either be called our boiling point, or it could be the condensation point. Typically, you'll see it referenced as the boiling point, and this would be the temperature at which that plateau occurs. So the boiling point for water is 100 degrees Celsius. Now this plateau is even bigger than the phase change between the solid and the liquid. When we're talking about a gas, the gas particles, if I draw a box here, are all spread out. There are no intermolecular forces between the gas particles. In a liquid, there still are. The particles might be moving around, but there's still this attractive force in between them as they flow around inside of our beaker. So there's this attraction between them. 
it's not as organized as it was in a solid, but to go from a liquid to a gas, you need to entirely break those IMFs, break those intermolecular forces, and that's what corresponds to a much larger plateau. Different substances have different strengths of those forces, so you'll often see when you look at different graphs, different heating curves will follow the same pattern, but the lengths of the plateaus, the lengths of the, uh, the sloped portions may be different dependent on the actual substance itself. Now when I look at one of these graphs, oftentimes you'll have questions that ask you, does uh, the process of going from a liquid to a gas, is that endo or exothermic? Because heat absorbed is my x-axis down here, whenever I read this graph, reading it left to right, so if I ever go from like letter A to letter C, or letter C to letter E, anytime I'm reading it from left to right, I'm adding energy into the substance itself. So adding energy as we go across would be an endothermic process. The substance itself is absorbing that energy. Now, we can look at cooling curves, which would basically just be the exact opposite of this shape. So we don't need a separate graph. We can just read our graph going right to left. So anytime I go from letter E to letter C, letter C to letter A, if I'm reading it from right to left, if I'm going from a gas to a liquid, that's an exothermic process. So I'm just reading my x-axis in reverse. This is the basic structure of heating curves. There's a couple of follow-up questions to look at on the notes below. So give it a shot and good luck.